More importantly, I think it sends a negative signal to the world, to the country, to the communities to say we don't actually value children particularly. A child doesn't have that much impact on emissions. And when he or she gets to 20, given the trajectory of renewable um, technology, I can't see how as societies, communities, economies, we avoid something pretty unpleasant happening. Hello and welcome back to The Focus. In a world where headlines often scream about overcrowding and resource depletion, a quieter but equally profound phenomenon is unfolding across the globe. From the bustling streets of Tokyo to the quiet rural areas of Europe, the human population is doing something once thought impossible. It's beginning to decline. Today we explore with the UK's leading demographer, Dr. Paul Morland, the unexpected twists of this demographic shift, uncovering what it means for our economies, societies and the planet itself. Join us as we delve into the world of shrinking populations and the complex tapestry of challenges and opportunities they present right here on The Focus. Paul, welcome to The Focus. Hello. So much easier not to say good morning or good evening yeah, yeah, well, in and you're in Australia. We can well, avoid well all done. that boring confusion. <laughs> all the weather, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Paul, starting with the UK, can you explain the two-child benefit gap? What does it mean and has it contributed directly to the UK's falling birth rates? And how significant is this policy's impact compared to other socioeconomic factors like housing affordability and job security? The two-child cap came on, I can't remember when, sometime during the last Tory government, which is, of course, a very long time because they came in in 2010 and they went out in 2024. And I think probably towards the latter end of that, and very simply, one got benefits per child. Um, and it usually slightly diminished from the first to the second child. And so on. I mean, that goes back to the welfare um, introduced by the Labour government after the Second World War. And what the last Tory government did was say, you will get it for your second child, but not for third or subsequent children, um, as an austerity measure, as a way of saving money. And what has the impact been? Well, it's always extremely difficult to disaggregate impacts. If you see a fall in fertility when something like that happens, and no simple causal link can be drawn, and for sure, when we see fertility rates falling, continually falling across most developed countries over the last four or five years, um, after a period of 50 years in which they've been below replacement, but there's sort of an extra dip going on now. And we see it in countries where they haven't introduced such a policy. Um, you have to be a little bit sceptical that that's um, necessarily the major event now uh, or the major cause of, of what's going on. Um, an awful lot of our low fertility has to do with women having no children or or only one. So I think if you crack that, um, if all the women who today have no children and who today having one child had two children, um, that would be a massive uh, uplift in our fertility rate. So, again, sort of statistics. I think the impact is probably fairly limited and you'd have to believe that people are having children or not having due to the due to benefits. Um, however, uh, surely if lots are not having any children or lots of women are only having one, then you need people to be having larger families to counterbalance that. And this is a discouragement. More importantly, I think it sends a negative signal to uh, the world, to the country, to the communities, to say we don't actually value children particularly. And more importantly, we don't recognise after 50 years of sub-replacement fertility rates that we have a problem. And one of the things I keep saying is, you know, pe people are asking, I've got a policy exchange paper coming out with, policy exchange, one of our major think tanks. I've written a paper with an economist called Philip Pilkington. You may know him from the Multipolarity podcast. And we've got a paper coming out next week, uh, next month from policy exchange. And one of the arguments, it's about essentially saying, uh, dear economic conservatives, you will never get back to a small state low tax 
without a radical change in our demography. I call it small state or small family. If you're going to have small families, you'll never have a small state. So in other words, dear economic conservatives, you need a bit of social conservatism if encouraging childbearing is social conservatism. But my point really on that is that in that paper, we talked a lot about how much detail we wanted to put in on policy. And my argument, we did put a bit in on policy, but my basic argument there is after 50 years of sub-replacement fertility, if our government has never had a word to say on the subject, if we have not even opened the Overton window, never mind talking about shifting it, mm -hmm. then I'm not particularly minded to get into detail on policy when we don't even ever have, have never had a government talking about it in the UK. It's not the same in Australia, for example. It's not the same in France and other developed and, and, and broadly Western countries. So my point then is that in order to change the very low fertility, which I think is a problem, or start moving it up, lots and lots of things are required. One of those things is a shift in the culture. And in order to start the culture shifting, I think the politicians need to acknowledge they have a problem. As long as there is this two-child cap in place, even if it doesn't have a direct link to falling fertility, it sends a broad signal that among the many problems and issues that the government is wrestling with, low fertility is not one of them. And until we get the government to start moving, to start talking about it, I don't think we can even begin to address what the right policies are. You know, it's interesting listening to what you say. Um, here in Australia, you'd be familiar with the fact that, I mean, as in Britain and other parts of the West, you know, we have a housing affordability crisis here in South Australia, for instance, you know, a lot of young couples who would normally be on their way in their early to mid 20s, at least, you know, or even their early 30s for that matter, would already have saved up a nest egg, have had mum and dad build a house somewhere if they come from a particular ethnic group that values those kind of things, and they'd be able to start a family. But there is a huge disincentive in the West, not just for not talking about the problem, but also by not having any pro-natalist policies. And by that, we have to bring in the housing affordability and also we're not building houses. So if you look at the labor market in the construction industry across the board, that is also contracting. And, you know, we may have governments issuing orders left, right and center, but who's going to be building those those new houses to allow younger people to, th it's, it's like, it's, it's like a push me, pull you kind of situation. You know, you can have government barking at one side and then you can have the, the reality of your construction industry not having enough laborers to actually create the quality housing for young people to feel safe and comfortable in to start families, right? Well, I talk a lot about housing and I'm very conscious of the issue. I'm going to be 60 in a few months, but I've got three children. Um, they've all managed to get housing in one sort or another, and two of them already have children of their own. The other one only got married last month. So I'm very conscious of the housing issue. And I think it's absolutely essential we do something very radical about it because we will not crack this problem until young people are able to afford homes, to leave their parental home, to set up their own families. However, and this is a very big however, where in the West or in the developed world housing is cheap? And there are such places. Scotland is a good example. Scotland's got quite uh, cheap housing in some parts of, of, of the country even parts of England, certainly much of Germany, much of Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, there are swathes of the developed world where housing is not really expensive relative to wages, and yet fertility is still low. Mm. So both on childcare and on housing, I think they are necessary, but absolutely not sufficient conditions to crap in order to resolve this problem. In other words, I think there are material issues but I think it's ideological, it's cultural issues more than any that actually um, are having an impact. And if you see migrant groups, say, in some places, or if you see, um, I mean, the, the best example of an urban high uh, cost housing, high fertility group are the Haredi Jews. If you look at the Amish or the Hutterites or whatever, they're often out in the countryside in quite cheap places. But where people are saying, you know, expensive urban living is is discouraging child childbearing, and I do believe that, then you have to say what cultures are actually overcoming that. Mm -hmm. you know, and they'll say, yes, of course, we'll crowd the kids into a room if necessary, but it's more important to have that extra child than for every child to have his or her own bedroom. So I'm not callously saying, this generation just expects everything laid on for them. We must 
resolve the housing problem. But I think a cultural shift at the same time. So we need somewhere in the middle. Housing does become more affordable, but at the same time, we have a cultural shift, which means that people really prioritise childbearing. Otherwise, we'll end up in a situation where if it goes lower and lower down people's priority lists, you end up saying, well, now we've got the housing, which is a big thing. I mean, we're not now we've got the childcare sorted out. You know, what else is it? And I do a lot of podcasts and I'm very interesting. I interested. I read the comments on YouTube and there is a certain mindset. Somebody called it the Guardian mindset it would be in, in <laughs> English terms, yeah. which is the world will never be good enough to have children. Once housing's crap, then it will be well, wages aren't high enough. Yeah, and, and and on and on and on. The material conditions in which our ancestors, my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents and yours had children were much harsher than those today. So we definitely need to focus on the material issues, but not kid ourselves that without a cultural shift, which will inform people's priorities, um, without that, uh, we, we're not going to get uh, anywhere, I don't think. On the fertility issue, there are other issues in the world. And cheaper housing would be a good thing in itself, but it's not going to crack this one unless we have a cultural revolution. You know, within any city confine, I mean, we can also be inclusive of the West. I mean, we have a notion in our heads that if we look at the global south and we see, you know, streams and streams of people living in tin sheds on the other side of wherever, you know, that uh, that, that somehow, you know, population is not really a problem for these particular countries. But if we look at the urban context itself, the urban environment, is it true to say that for those countries that have welfare systems, that it's usually at the lower socioeconomic levels that have more children because they can exploit the welfare system to their advantage? Or is this just an urban myth? What, what, what do you say about that? The socioeconomic, so we look a lot at uh, uh, ethnic differences in, in a national differences in fertility. Socioeconomic differences get less coverage, but it is also an interesting story. So if you go back to Edwardian England, for example, um, contraception was available and affordable only to probably upper middle class people. I mean, I wish I could have interrogated my great grandparents on their practice of contraception. Uh, all my grandparents were born before the First World War. Right. Um, and I never really asked my grandparents, which is a shame. But I mean, they were married in the interwar periods. So it's slightly different. So what happened if you actually learn there's good data on um, the socioeconomic fertility breakdown in Britain or in England and Wales, probably in the Edwardian period. Um, and that was a period. So in the 1860s, 70s, women on average were having six children in the UK. By the First World War, it was down to three. And it was a very much a socioeconomically driven thing. Um, broadly, at the very, very top, the super rich aristocrats still had large families because they could afford it. But ignoring them, the upper middle classes were getting contraception. And the lower you went down the pecking order socially, the bigger the families, pretty much. Um and then uh, the biggest families were sort of labour aristocracy and, and, and the core of the working class. Maybe the, some data suggests the very, very poorest had smaller families. Broadly, it was correlated, uh, inversely correlated with socioeconomic status and wealth. And I always say that's the eugenics moment. That's the moment that the middle classes panic and say, oh, my goodness, um, the wrong sort of breeding. What will that do to the stock? And of course, social Darwinism was very alive at that point. Um, and probably fed by this. And I think that different countries reach that moment at the same time. So I have a very good friend who's a Singaporean. And when she went back to Singapore, uh, very meritocratic society. So she and many of her friends came from quite modest backgrounds. Uh, they were bright. They were sent to Oxford and Cambridge. When they came back, they were the ones that um, who uh, Lee Kuan Yew wanted to breed. Um, and at that point, Singapore was in the same situation of as Britain had been sort of 70 years earlier of the wealthier, better educated, uh, not having children. And obviously this isn't an urban rural thing because in, everyone's urban in Singapore by definition. Um, and the poorer kids, the less educated kids were still having larger families and younger and so on. So that was his eugenics moment. So you went, if you like, and Singapore shows it in a nice fairly short period from we're going to be overcrowded, have fewer children in the 60s, to can we encourage the right sort to breed in the 80s? My friend was sent on love cruises and so encouraged to have, marry and have children. 
by the time you get to this century, the whole fertility rate is very low in Singapore. And if you look at the UK, what you find, even until relatively recently, there was high, somewhat higher fertility lower down the pecking, social pecking order. And I think that had a lot to do with more girls in their late teens were having children, um, maybe not intending to. Um, you know, it's not that the contraception wasn't available, but perhaps they didn't have the uh, foresight or the planning or the support, whatever it was. And where we've seen fertility rates continue to fall, or actually, you know, they, they went sub replacement in the 70s, but they were pretty flat for a long time in places like Britain and America. They went up, they went down a bit. Where we've seen, and I've, I don't know the Australian data, but it may well be the same in Australia. Where we've seen a further fall in fertility in the last few years, it's been very much, as far as we can work out, the lowest socioeconomic categories. Um, moving towards those lower norms of the more educated and the better off. Um, and when you look at the ethnic picture, and again, I don't know the Australian data, or I'd be amazed if it weren't the same. It's certainly the case in America that a big part of the fall off in American US fertility over the last few years has been the rapid convergence of Latina fertility. with the So it was the case that people from Latin America had high fertility rate. They barely do now. And that's partly because they converge with a local norm and partly because the places they're coming from have much lower fertility rates. So if you want to, if you look at the difference between US and Mexican fertility in the 1970s, you might have found it was like six women in Mexico, two women in the States. It was a four child difference. Now, there's almost no difference between US and Mexican fertility. I mean, it's very small, maybe a third or a quarter of a child. Similarly, if you look at India, and I appreciate a lot of UK immigrants aren't coming from South, South Asian immigrants, aren't coming directly from India. It might be Pakistan. They might be people of East African uh, origin with, with India before that. But many, many of these communities, as far as we have the data, have actually falling and low fertility rates. Um, the Afro-Caribbean community is the only minority community in this country which had a decline in numbers at the last census. That's partly to do with intermarriage and recategorization. But the fact is that most minority ethnic groups are converging to low fertility and less well-educated, less well-off people who, in, until the relatively recent past, were still having somewhat larger families, even if it was because they were, you know, getting pregnant at an early age. Um, that's also going. So, sorry, rather long-winded answer to a, a brief question, but I hope that's enlightened you. It has. Thank you for that. Now, Paul, in the UK, you challenge the conventional mindset of overpopulation by highlighting underpopulation risks. How do other countries with similar demographic issues plan to tackle these challenges? Are there successful examples of nations reversing these trends without coercive reproductive policies? OK, well, I... I don't really talk about the UK that much. I've written four books and I'm about to write a fifth. And none of them focus on the UK particularly. Any, I mean, they, the, the one that tells the human tide, which tells the history of the, of, of the demographic transition globally, focuses on the UK a bit because that's where, where the demographic transition started. But if you're writing a book about low fertility as a pr human problem, there's no particular reason to focus on the UK. It's very typical of a European country. I mean, there are somewhat countries that have managed to have higher, slightly higher fertility rates in recent years, like France and Sweden. There are plenty of European countries with low ones. There's nothing actually that interesting about the UK. Um, developed countries have this problem across the board. Um, <clears throat> so the question then is, what are they doing about it? Well, I've said the UK is doing nothing about it and has not even acknowledged it. The only politicians who've talked about it are a small number of brave backbenchers. One of them is a friend of mine, Miriam Cates, who went on Radio 4 and and, and the interviewer, it also interviewed, also interviewed me on Radio 4, but I'm not a politician, said, don't you feel you need to be quite brave even to talk about this? And she said, yes. So um, there was a, a Labour politician who was going to join Miriam and a friend of mine on a, on a um, talk and was kind of bounced out of it. So there is... Um, so we, we haven't even started the discussion. It's very interesting in Australia, 
um, you know, the the baby bonus back sort of twenty years ago. Was it Paul Costello? Have I got the name? Was it? Yeah, uh, I think it was under 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 the Liberal Party government. Yeah. yeah. And he said, I mean, slightly tongue in cheek, perhaps one for mum, one for dad, and one for the gun. That does seem to have had an effect. So baby bonus seemed to help a bit, but then it was kind of watered down and got rid of. I just came back yesterday from Hungary, which is a really interesting case because they're desperately trying to get the fertility rate up. And they're kind of reorganizing the whole state system or the welfare state around the need to increase the fertility rate. Now, the, inc- the fertility rate in Hungary has ticked up. And what are they doing? Oh, there's financial incentives. There's cut. You know, they're trying trying to change the whole culture. It's quite a long term project. It's tipped up, but not really more than in surrounding countries from like 1.1 to 1.5, which is not insignificant. The reason that probably happened, it's a technicality called the tempo effect, which is that while you're in a period where women are having children later and later, while the age of average birth is rising, the TFR, the total fertility rate, is depressed somewhat artificially. And then once once that stops and it, it people stop delaying their childbearing, and it which they can only do to a certain point in the comes, then the TFR rises. So it's probably in reality, um, I could get very technical here comparing total fertility rates with completed cohort fertility rates. Your listeners are not that interested, I shouldn't think. But 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 essentially it was probably Part of the rise has got to do with this tempo effect, but part of it has got to do with the pronatal policies. And the interesting thing in Hungary is there's been a massive rise in the marriage rate. So it may, what that suggests to me, I mean, you might hope that that would then lead to a rise in fertility immediately, which it hasn't. But it does suggest a shift in the culture mm-hmm. and cultural shifts are really hard to achieve. So if it's shifting the culture, we may well see a rise in fertility rates down the line. So who's tried what else? Well, um, you know, you could say material incentives, cultural incentives. Um, Israel, of course, is the poster child, as it were, of high fertility developed countries. It's the only developed country, urban country, wealthy country, educated country, where uh, the fertility rate's above two. It's actually three, uh, which is extraordinary. And there, the government's put a lot of money into IVF, but, uh, but actually... It's not really about the government. It's about um, the culture and um, the uh, benefits for children were also curbed in terms of how many children get benefits. The uh, rights on maternity leave are not very long. Um, So that's my point. But whatever the government does, if it's doing it against the background of a antenatal culture, it won't get very far. But if there's a pronatal culture, you always don't need the government to do that much. And Israel's a good example of that. Um, and there have been all sorts of incentives tried in different countries, tax breaks. Um, France has had a very favorable tax policy towards um, people with families. And that's probably accounted to some extent for France's persistently higher fertility rates than most of uh, the rest of Europe. Um, Sweden, again, traditionally had a higher fertility rate, although it's now gone down. And there was very much about rights of women, helping women in the workforce with childcare and rights for women combining careers. Um, And then um, a really interesting case, although it's not quite what we'd say the first world is Georgia in the Caucasus, where the archbishop said he would baptized the third and subsequent children and that seems to have been at least the same time happened the same time as a boost in the birth rate so there is no secret magic formula um and what works at one time won't work at another time and what works in one place won't work in another place so i'm afraid it's a global phenomenon low fertility which is going to have to have local solutions but i think those local solutions will need innovation they'll need thought They'll need tinkering and changing and experimenting and learning from best practice elsewhere. Um, that hot, there's a there's a, a big job to be done and an ongoing job to be done. And again, the thing about the UK to come back to the UK is we haven't even acknowledged there's a problem. So how would you even start uh, to do that? What I think necessary job of looking at every possible which way to raise the fertility rate, cultural material social, political, and everything else. You know, it's really interesting. Um, I was thinking while you were talking, what impact does a misanthropic view of the world have in all of this? I mean, 
you know, when you pick up a newspaper, you listen to the news, you always hear the gloom and the doom and people will always make judgments, especially younger people. Younger people tend to be a little bit more idealistic in their thinking. So they'll probably make a judgment, a rather profound judgment about the state of the world and whether or not the world is worth having children in. Because, you know, we're a filthy species. We like war. Uh, there's no security, you know, in terms of the way that we live our lives in our own polities, for instance, let alone what neighboring states may think of those polities. So there are a bunch of things that, again, you know, are very complex to unpack, but obviously have some impact on the thinking process of a young couple moving forward. Oh, oh and there's the other thing, too. Woke ideology. <laughs> I have to raise it. Paul, we're living in a world now where, you know, the idea of a woman isn't quite as straightforward as it once was. And there are very powerful and influential voices out there pushing a particular agenda, which is not just anti-natal, it's anti-human in a way. It's very much centered on the atomized individual. It's all about me. Look at me. I'm different. I'm unique. I'm special. And everyone needs to treat me accordingly. But it's got nothing to do with community. It's got nothing to do with reaching out across boundaries. You know, although they do, they, they have this expectation that we all need to bow down and scrape to various uh, ideas of what they may have in their, in their, in their, in their heads. But what, what do you think this all has on the... Well, you've covered an awful lot of ground there. I mean, the first thing I would say is it's very difficult to, again, to know exactly what is powerfully causing this fall in fertility. Mm. Um, and I certainly have my reposts to all of these. So to those mm. who say the world has got um, so awful I couldn't bring children in, I point out, you know, there are so many great thinkers uh, like Bjorn Lomborg or Matt Ridley who've written great books saying, hold on a minute, do you have any idea how much better your lives are than that of your parents, your grandparents? I always say, you know, when I was born, the Cuban Missile Crisis had just blown over. How could my parents have had children in the shadow of nuclear catastrophe? All my grandparents were born before the First World War, and, you know, the clouds were gathering over Europe. My parents were born in the in the interwar period. <laughs> just, you know, my mother was born in Germany in 1933. I mean, what a disaster. What an <laughs> awful time to be born in. And so, so um, you know, my grandparents, my great-grandparents were all obviously criminally insane to have children. So things are so much better now than they were then. Um, and again, it gets back, and I don't mean to be rude about The Guardian. They did actually once review one of my books quite favorably. But there is a sort of Guardian Easter view of the world, which is it's so awful, capitalist, mm. dirty, ugly. Mm. Um, until we do X, Y, and Z, we won't have children. X, Y, and Z will never stop. It will be, we, we'll have to have a utopia. And by the by, the time we even got anywhere close to that, there will be no one left. Yeah. So I kind of dismiss that. And I think what would be really helpful there is if people had a better historical understanding of changing material conditions. The fact that when my grandfather was born, for example, in the 1880s, probably a third of children didn't make it to five, right? So, you know, there's that. Then there's the whole, well, even if life's good now, it's about to turn into a global catastrophe because of global warming and so on. There I make a number of arguments. Um, one is that um, a child doesn't have that much impact on emissions. And when he or she gets to 20, given the trajectory of renewable um, technology, will probably, they probably won't have many emissions. And secondly, that you need a young population to come up with new ideas and innovations that will save the planet. And if you look at Japan with its ageing, it's had fewer and fewer patents, fewer and fewer new ideas. Very much, I'm very much in the kind of Julian Simon school. I don't know if you know him, an economist in the US of the 20th century, but he uh, he put a, had a bet with Paul Ehrlich, the sort of perennial, still going um, pessimist and Malthusian on the price of commodities. And he said, look, the price of commodities will go up because we'll run short of them. And then with a higher price, people will find substitutes. They'll be incentivized to find new sources and so on. So with young, innovative minds, we'll crack a lot of these problems. If we if we become a, a just a sort of glorified old age home, um, we won't. So that's that aspect. Now, in terms of woke, you know, woke involves a lot of cultural issues. Mm -hmm. All I would say on that and on the this is the worst world ever 
outlook and on the oh the other thing on global warming of course is that if you consume the labor of other people and you won't produce it you have mass immigration from low emissions to high emissions countries so that doesn't really help that's a false economy but my point all the woke stuff plus that creates a culture that is antenatal very very hard to quantify um that's why I say, as well as making material changes like to housing and childcare and the rights of women in the workplace and so on and so on and so on, we have to have a different sort of culture. Now, I cannot single handedly create that culture or tell you what that culture is, partly because no one person could, partly because someone of my age is not tuned in to the culture as directly of those of childbearing age as say my children would be. So I get information from my children. Having children, one of the great things about having kids is it does keep you somewhat current, right? But yeah. you know, th there's no way some 59 year old guy in England is gonna come up with the manifesto for how we shift the culture. And shifting culture is really complicated. It's gotta be, we need to move to a world where having children is cool. I mean, it is an amazing and wonderful thing. And I perhaps spend too much time talking about the economics and the technicalities and not enough about how wonderful it is. But we've got to move to a world where having children is cool, where you can organize. We, you know, we want mass education at a higher level for men and women, but we need to do it in a different way. Why do we have to do it exactly this way? I leave school. I take a year off to discover myself. Then I do a university course. Then I don't know what to do. And I do a master's. Then I think about being doing a PhD, but I get a job somewhere. I've had enough of that. And I go off for a couple of years. You yep. know, and when I come back from backpacking around the Andes, you know, I'm heading for 30 and I haven't really seriously. So I think the way we, we do our lives, we need to reorder. And then we're not going to reorder them because some guy in London tells you to. We're going to reorder them because there's a shift in the culture. I'm just saying there needs to be a shift in the culture so that actually this is something people really want to do, something people value. And um, no doubt they will look back on their lives and feel they were of higher value because they have children because they created a future for their communities, their societies and themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you get to your 70s or 80s and you haven't, had, well, when you get to your 40s or 50s and you haven't had children, mm -hmm. I think particularly for women, a great deal of regret sets in. So it's not only good for us socially, but if we had a longer term view of our own lives, we would reorder them and prioritize them in a different way so that we did start having our kids in their 20s, in our 20s, and, um, and and that can only really happen when the culture changes very radically from where it is today. And I can't isolate exactly which elements of the sort of pessimism, the wokeism and all, you know, I, it's difficult to disentangle. Mm. But with the culture of the Generation Z group or Z group that I see, I can't see uh, a turnaround in our fertility rate. I can only see it going lower. Yeah, that's a sad point. But, um, you know, talking about attitudes and culture, of course, we, we, we in the West live in an economic culture of neoliberal capitalism. Um, and I don't know, but uh, my casual observation is that that has led to the rise of material atheism in the West. How has this phenomenon played its role in tamping down the idea of having larger families? I mean, when everything is all about the material gratification, the whole Gordon Gecko greed is good mentality, um, that surely cannot help matters when we judge ourselves by the car we drive, by the status symbols that we can achieve in life, not by the children that we have and how well educated they are. Well, again, it's difficult to be very social scientific on this and come up with uh, an absolute uh, answer to your question, but we can empirically look at a number of phenomena. For example, in the data I have seen from the United States, from Britain, from France, from Israel, and probably and Spain, other countries, there's not a single consistent data set, but some measure of religiosity, whether it's, I think in France, did you go to mass as a child? In Spain, do you, the, the data, it's not a single consistent um, data set, but it definitely suggests that the more religious you are, the more likely, however defined, and that may be defined differently in different countries and different religions, um, the more children you will have. So that definitely supports the idea that a belief in some kind of uh, meaning beyond our daily material lives is correlated with um, having more children. 
And that then gets back to a book of a friend of mine, my PhD supervisor, actually, Eric Kaufman. I don't know if you've come across him. He wrote a book uh, in 2010 called, or published a book in 2010, Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth? And Eric said to me, can we do, I mean, he's not religious. I'm more religious than he is. I'm more practicing and, and committed. As far as I know, Eric is, is pretty much non-observant and atheistic. But his, his challenge to me was, his question to me was, can this be done? i.e. can we reverse this low fertility problem without some kind of major religious revival? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anybody does. And religiously inclined though I am, I would like to think that we won't need a mass rise in religion to reverse this. Mm. I, I, We do need to move away from this kind of very materialistic, individualistic culture which is very easy to say. But then what are the routes out of it and where do they go? Do they only and necessarily lead to religion and religiosity or are there other alternatives? I hope there are other alternatives, but again, I can't tell you that. I don't think anybody knows. We live in a war-wracked society right now, so I'm going to have to shift things into a more security framework. There is one person in the world who's making a very big deal about demography as part of looking at countries' strategies and potentials to move forward. And that person, uh, that person's name is Peter Zine. I don't know whether or not you've come across his work. Um, his latest book, The End of the World is Only the Beginning, is a very depressing look at how he believes that everything that we have grown up with and gotten used to will eventually just atrophy and fall to pieces because we won't have enough people within our nation states to, you know, keep the supply chains going, you know, keep the economies growing. I mean, I think that, uh, what is it, Ian Bremer had this whole notion of a, a, a zero G, a zero growth world, which again sort of plays into this, the, the, this notion of, you know, demography and will we have enough people to make things happen. But from a security perspective, the demographic trends in Russia and China, Zion says, are um, influencing national strategies. Um, and obviously they will have an impact on these countries' ability to project power globally. Now, since we are seeing an active war between Ukraine and Russia, and Russia and Ukraine have got demographic problems, <laughs> is this war going to be something that's going to literally break the back of both countries moving forward, do you think? Well, I don't know Zion personally, although he um, actually gave a very generous tribute to my book, Tomorrow's People in, uh, oh no, it was actually uh, The Human Tide in, I think, his latest book. So he has some awareness of my work. Um, mm. and I, I I do follow, I, you know, I, I see the odd thing that he puts out. Clearly, he's, he's a very interesting thinker. I wouldn't subscribe to everything he says, mm. and I'm not a geostrategist. But just to start with sort of societal collapse, I don't see how it could be avoided if we end up with Korean style fertility rates. So if each cohort in a country is a third of the size of the last, and we're only just starting to see what this means for shrinking working age populations. I don't know how you can prevent socioeconomic collapse. It may be that some countries can attract immigrants that has its own problems, but that's not a luxury every country has. I mean, China is not rich enough, nor does it have a culture that is accessible to high fertility populations. Um, and it would have to be hoovering up vast quantities. So it's not going to save China immigration. It's not going to save Japan. And 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 we're already seeing the issue of immigration and demographic change as the most important issue in European politics. If you want to understand the rise of Front National or Brexit and, and reform or the AFD and so on, Maloney, I mean, the, the European populations are aware of the fact that they are a declining and that they are spotting or seeing massive ethnic change in their countries. Now, the point I make, and that was a, the first paper I wrote with Philip Pilkington for the ARC conference. Uh, I don't know if you were aware of the ARC conference. It actually had a lot of Australian um, yeah. participation. But but the point we made in that is, is don't complain about immigration if you're not having your own children and you expect the economy to keep rolling. Yeah. So... But, but anyway, if you get to Japanese levels or Korean levels or even where we are now, it just takes it's just a question of how long it takes before 
of the population goes down and down, I, for a whole set of reasons, I don't think technology is is going to be the the um, uh, savior here. So I can't see how, as societies, communities, economies, we avoid something pretty unpleasant happening. The way I always put it is Japan had 100 million people in the 60s when the population was growing, and it will have 100 million again in the middle of the century. So what's the big deal? Well, when it was on the way up, it had eight workers to every pensioner. Mm. On the way down, it would be barely one to one. So you can change the pension age by a few years, but that's not going to change a very starkly different Japan. We'll be less creative. We'll be terribly short of labor. Welfare states will, will collapse. And I don't see how governments will be able to support their commitments, or the current commitments they have to people or to service their debt. So I think a lot of very bad problems will come down the line. Um, on the geo strategy, the interesting thing about Ukraine, is, the war in Ukraine, is that it's very unusual to have older countries, countries with old high median age populations, um, having a war. It's very unusual. Um, and I've made the case that whether it's Northern Ireland or the Balkans or actually Catalonia, there are so many wars that are not happening because the population is quite old. And if I, I reckon that if the Catalans median age was in the mid 20s, not the mid 40s, after the referendum they had recently in the last sort of 10 years, um, a few hotheads would have headed up to the Pyrenees and taken some pot shots at some police stations. And before you'd have known it, it'd have been a civil war. So a lot of war that's not happening. There's no doubt that both Ukraine and, and Russia are very constrained by demography. Of course, Russia has a much larger population, but Russia has not had conscription yet. Mm -hmm. And it has not formally said this is a war. And I think it's very, very difficult to do in a country where the fertility rate has been so low for so long. We don't have that many people. And um, it, 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 there, there's this uh, theory, I forget the name of the writer, I have talked about him, a German writer who talks about how the the lust for war, the enthusiasm for war goes down when you're in a world where women are only having one son, if that so um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I do think so. I don't have a grand theory of geo strategy, mm -hmm. but I do think that everyone who thinks about geo strategy should factor demography into it. Now, whether they factor it to the extent, you know, whether it's fair to factor it to the extent of Peter, Z Peter Zion does, I don't know. I appreciate him because I think he takes demography very seriously. Yeah. So even if he somewhat sometimes overstates the impact of demography, I think that is a good corrective to those very large number of thinkers and analysts who take no account of it at all. Yeah, oh, look, I agree with you, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that strikes me uh, with regard to the tensions that we currently see in the Pacific between the United States and China is that, you know, when you look at the impact of the one-child policy on Chinese uh, China's population um, over the last couple of generations, you know, now they are back to one child all right but that one child if it goes into uniform and then there is a shooting war will be dead or maimed and i don't think any parent of that child will be very happy with the communist party leadership to have had sacrificed their only one child you know so i think that that is also a, a, yeah i agree with you i think that that is a break on it's a constraint but we should yeah. ignore the fact that there are an awful lot of chinese and also that the government in china is not hugely um sensitive to public opinion of course it's it, it's foolish to say oh, it's a dictation but it takes no yeah. account of public opinion at all yeah but you know some governments are more sensitive to public opinion and mourning mothers and so on than others it is interesting that the soviet union seemed to have been more sensitive yeah. to the kids yeah. coming back in zinc uh boxes from afghanistan yes. than mm -hmm. putin does yeah. to what's happening now and it could explain why he is so keen to send people from the peripheries and the, the yeah. edges. Uh, you know, nice middle class boys from Moscow are not yet dying. Well, it'll be interesting to see how if the Kursk salient that the Ukrainians have created for themselves stays as is and becomes a kill box for uh, Russian conscripts, you know, that may actually start reverberating in a very negative way in Moscow. But we will wait and see how that happens. I'm Whatever John... happens, oh, it will be more negative and more difficult for yeah. Moscow than if people had been having four or five children on average. Oh, absolutely. For the, as, as they had been, say, at the time of the first world war. 
just on that point, you know, I, I, I remember um, because I'm part Austrian, part Italian. So uh, on the Austrian side of the family, my, my grandfather was in the Wehrmacht and, you know, part of his time was on the Eastern Front. And he told me about the Russian steamroller and, and I remember his stories of his father who fought the Russians in World War One. were talking about the Russian bear and the Russian steamroller. There was this notion that Russia just had an inexhaustible supply of people that they could just literally throw at any enemy and eventually that enemy will be crushed. Um, and now it seems that, you know, the, the thinking of that mythologized idea is certainly within Putin's mental state, but I think that the practicalities of it will probably trip him up at some point, yeah? Again, and you know, I, I, I think to uh, demography creates the conditions. In, it's one of the very important forces and underrated forces yeah. that create the conditions in which history is made. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's not deterministic. And I've always said you cannot read. So the Human Tide, my second book, tried to say demography matters in history. Let's see how it has done since yeah. the demographic transition began. Mm -hmm. But. I also say that if you knew all you could possibly know about the demography of Europe in 1925, mm. you could not have predicted the Second World War. Mm, so true. history is made under certain conditions. Demo demographic conditions are important to understanding history. And if you're trying to understand where we are geostrategically, understanding the sorts of opportunities and constraints of demography is really important. But to read from that to therefore this will happen, I think is uh, somewhat simplistic. And, you know, those who are prepared to do it, I admire. They're brave um, in terms of sticking their necks out. Um, all I can say is both sides are facing demographic constraints. We can see already what's happened in, uh, you know, we can, we can already point to certain things which are as a result of, Ukraine and Russia as they are fighting, as opposed to a kind of Ukraine and Russia in a parallel universe where fertility had been high for the last few years or the last few decades. And generally, though, it is worth noting that most wars that go on, obviously, we focus very much on this war. It's European. Um, it, it's it, a, a superpower is involved or a great power. Um, we pay less, a lot less attention to much more common wars in places where the populations are very young, like Syria, much of the Middle East in the 2010s, like Sudan today, um, like uh, Central Africa. So I uh, like Gaza. So I think, um, you know, our view is distorted somewhat. And there is a general fact that um, uh, the, 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 as populations age, they're less likely to go to war. That doesn't mean they'll never go to war. And we've seen that in Ukraine and Russia. Nice. So I, I prefer to see Demography is something that, that, that shapes history and not something that dictates it. I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast. From the UK, we're speaking with leading demographic expert and author, Dr. Paul Morland. Paul is an associate research fellow at Birkbeck College, University of London, and an author. His latest book being No One Left, Why the World Needs More Children. All right. So, Paul, what are some of the most innovative policy responses that you've observed globally? Now, we spoke about or touched upon this earlier, that there are varying degrees of moves to try to overcome this. But what are the best ones that you've observed up to now? Are there best ones, best practice? Well, again, that sort of focuses on policy. Mm. And I always say policy can be pushing at an open door or a closed door, and the, the nature of the door, the nature of the lock, is culture. Mm -hmm. So then that gets me to the position where I think, what can politicians do to change the culture? And that's much more subtle. I do think that the um, in initiative of the church in Georgia in the Caucasus was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's interesting to observe, again, that Israel doesn't have fantastically pronatal policies, but it does have a fantastically pronatal culture. So if I were ushered in to uh, number 10 or, or some other ministry, the chance would be a fine thing and ask for my opinion. I would say look very widely at the economic, cultural and um, other incentives that are put in play. Try different things, appreciate there is no one magic bullet. Mm -hmm. Be prepared to change things over time. I mean, for example, um, I argued in an article in the Sunday Times a couple of years ago that a really good way to signal 
that the state would like people to have more children. And to encourage it would be to offer tax breaks for people with children. And rather than go to the chancellor and say, dear chancellor, you need to be spending 30 billion a year on this. And if you don't, the, the sky is going to fall in. I and everyone else, you need to be spending another 30 billion on dot, 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 you know, international aid, arms and so on. I don't want to be the 25th person in the queue saying the whole economy needs to be devoted to my particular uh, shtick. But I would say, um, why not vary the tax rate? Why not make it fiscally neutral? And that does mean raising tax rates on the um, people who don't have children. Now, that gave rise to a lot of controversy, actually more controversy than my book, funnily enough, because I think in a book you can address all these issues in more detail. Um, but I do point out that having variable tax rates for those who have and don't have children is quite normal in sort of middle of the road, liberal, social democratic countries from from France and Luxembourg, left wing countries like Cuba, right wing countries like Hungary. So um, it's not really a political thing or it shouldn't be a party political thing or a left right thing. Um, and, and there are other uh, incentives. I mean, I said, for example, slightly tongue in cheek, although some people thought I was being a bit stupid. Well, what about a, a, a certificate from the Queen or a, as, as we had a Queen in those days? Um, or oh, the king, of course, now some kind of national, you know, it's all very well sent. We, we have this idea of the telegram when you reach 100 from the queen, people used to get a telegram. I don't know if they did in Australia. Oh, they did, yeah. But, but, but you know, why, why not say, well, that's a lovely achievement, but why not celebrate people? Oh, you know, that's then like Hitler giving medals to, well, Stalin gave medals to mothers, Ben-Gurion gave medals to mothers. You know, left-wing yeah. people yeah. did, right-wing yeah. people did, middle-of-the-road yeah. people did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think in, in Britain particularly, there's a kind of hysterical... Um, leap to oh you know he's a pronatalist he must be a nazi and i i wrote one article in response to that kind of attack which is that i had the discussion with britain's last and late chief rabbi john the sachs who reminded me that all i was advocating was the first law in the bible or mitzvah and the torah as he would say peru or revu be fruitful and multiply mm -hmm. so i think we i think getting over all getting over the nonsense and hysteria is good and i think i'm pleased to say that there's been relatively little in response to my book um that doesn't answer your question what's the silver bullet there is no silver bullet experiment trial error understanding the cultural as well as the economic incentives and being prepared to to change your approach over time, but making it a really high national priority. I'm going to raise a couple of things here. I mean, look, honestly, this is a great conversation. Um, one is male sperm production. Now, we understand that that's actually in decline in volume and quality around the world. So how is this a physical manifestation of lower numbers of children being born? And what, according to the latest science, is said to be causing this? OK, so the best data I have is that a couple at a reasonable age with reasonable sexual congress attempting to have children still generally has children within a fairly short period of time. Now, that it may be that the sperm count is coming down. I leave it to the scientists to figure out whether that's happening and why and what we should do about it. That is not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. But it's not down yet generally at a level that is preventing most people having children. So however important that may be biologically, it's not much of an issue now in terms of explaining the fertility rate. The way, I rather, I, this came up on a podcast. I, I did a spectator TV podcast with the author Lionel Shriver, who you may know, who's yeah. very interested in this stuff, has reviewed my books and is, is, is a friend. And um, I sort of came up with this expression. I thought it was quite good, actually. I said, it's a bit like the ship is sinking we're taking in water and someone's standing on deck with a telescope and saying we're about to hit an iceberg. Well, we may be about to hit an iceberg. We should be looking at and worrying about it. Yeah. But we know that today the ship is sinking and, and that ship is, the ship is sinking and that's not because we've hit an iceberg. Yeah. In other words, the bio, there is very little biological explanation as to why our fertility rate has gone down at this point. So, so, Paul, you know, on the contra of this, of course, we've got the, the, the male issue that we've just spoken about, but then there's also the female issue. And that is, you know, 
females have greater access to education, contraception, and a whole bunch of things that they, they really didn't have access to generations ago, not that long ago, quite frankly. Has this actually had much of an expectation in raising female expectations about what their life is meant to be? And do they consider themselves now, especially in the West, to be post-maternal in their thinking? You know, that, that the child and having a child is sort of like an afterthought. And while they're young, they go out and party and they go climb the Himalayas or do something that, you know, as you earlier pointed out, fulfills them. And there's that ideology that I suppose you could say it's feminism that drives and justifies a lot of this in, in their minds. So, you know, and they don't want men to talk about their reproductive position in society because they think that that's, well, paternalistic. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky situation, but obviously when we're talking about population, we've got to address these things because the policymakers have to know that to get on top of it, you know, a lot of that came from policy that encouraged all of this thinking. So how do you undo that? Because that's now very firmly implanted in the minds of at least two generations of women since the sexual revolution in the 1960s. In my book, I've got a chapter about feminism. It was quite a long chapter at one point, and it got significantly culled. And mm -hmm. it, it covered the whole history of feminism, and it's it's quite variable attitudes to childbearing. Yes, there have been radical third wave type feminists or second wave, I think probably who were very antenatal, but there have been plenty of feminists from Mary Wollenstein Craft yeah. to uh, all the way through to uh, people like um, Erica Badiaki today and 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 plenty of others um, who see. Um, childbearing and rearing as something a uh, sort of incredible powerful uh thing that, about women so i don't think feminism per se is a problem i think that it's true if women have got other things to do than just have children they'll do those as well the question is how you combine it mm -hmm. we know that in more patriarchal countries like japan like greece where women maybe get the educational opportunities, but don't get the opportunities to combine career with childbearing. They yeah. just don't have children. <clears throat> so any kind of retreat to a 1950s model is not going to solve the fertility problem. And of course, taking a lot of women out of the workplace isn't going to solve, isn't going to help the economic problem either. Mm -hmm. So what I argue is we need, and again, it's not down to me. I'm not going to be able to do this single-handedly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a bit like the question about religion. Can we do this without reversing you know if we need religion to do this and we don't get religious revival that means we can't do it well i don't want to be defeatist because we haven't really tried yet mm -hmm. similarly i don't want to say this will never happen without reversing feminism i think we need to re reinvent feminism from a lot of pre-existing material that's quite pronatal mm -hmm. to say you know my daughters so i've got two daughters and a son both my daughters got very good educations um are pursuing very serious careers both started their families before they were 30. Now, that can't be, I, that's not impossible, surely. A no. society where we organise things to acknowledge the fact that women are just as clever as men, just as interested and interesting as men, just as able to pursue. They may want to, they may not. They may prefer to stay at home, perhaps a man. Prefer. We need a very flexible model. Mm. Uh, but we need a model that acknowledges the full equality of women uh, and at the same time, um, combines that with having children. And if we don't do that, since we're not going back to the 1950s, we're not going to fix the fertility problem. And I don't think it's impossible. Put it this way, we haven't really tried. So mm. until, let's not let's not declare defeat before we've engaged in the battle. No, I like your, your optimism there. I, I, we, we touched on Japan earlier, but, you know, Japan is not a statistical anomaly. <laughs> Things are pretty dire over there. I mean, young people don't even seem to be having sex for recreation anymore. Also, I heard somewhere on the grapevine that, what was it, last year, 4,000 elderly people died alone in their flats, often left undiscovered for weeks. I mean, that's if that's the future, that's not a good future to aim for, right? No, and the last Prime Minister of Japan talked about societal collapse. The, the interesting thing about Japan is, first of all, its fertility rate is not any more that low compared to other countries, not right. because it's picked up, hmm. but because other countries have sunk to and below its level. So that's hmm. quite alarming. What makes Japan an interesting case that we can learn from 
is that Japan had an early drop below replacement fertility, about slightly earlier than Europe and all that, but then it was much lower for a longer time. So when we were bobbing, we and the Americans and probably Australia were bobbing around at 1.8, 1.9 for decades, mm. they were bobbing around at 1.3, 1.4. So they got baked into their demographic pyramid, if you like, a worse situation. Um, and that's why we say so it's just it, it's not that it's actually been longer than elsewhere or that today it's lower than elsewhere. It's just that it's been lower than most other places for a long time. And so the structure of Japanese society, the support ratio, the number of people working age to those of retirement age is just particularly skewed in a way that the rest of us are, are heading towards. And yes, you can come up with all sorts of unpleasant anecdotes in Japan, the aging and the fall off of creativity and, and um, patents and new innovations. Uh, the, the fact that, um, yes, there's a whole industry of defumigating apartments where people have died and been neglected for uh, bodies have rotted. You know, I'm not saying that never happens elsewhere, but it's, it's enough of a phenomenon in Japan to have bred an industry. The fact that not properly... Um, supported by data but but quite possibly they're making more nappies for old people than for babies um it, it gives us an indication of where we're all headed it yep. should be a warning mm. um that's what i'm trying to uh, to say in my book mm. uh let's look what you know this is the most advanced case of a, a journey that we're all on mm. um it's high time to reassess whether we want to be on that journey Paul, one can't talk about immigration without talking about that thorny topic of social integration. I mean, if mass migration is being seen by our political leaders, and God love them, they are a simple-minded bunch, as the silver bullet to our falling populations, social stability has to be seen as equally important. Yet the left and right of the political spectrum in most countries seem to be playing a very cynical politics as far as immigration is concerned, disadvantaging both nativist and immigrant communities alike. Do you have any ideas of how one can change this dynamic? Well, in my book, Tomorrow's People, that was my third book. That's the last book. I talk about the demographic um, trilemma, which yeah, I've done various podcasts on and so on. Um, and the idea of the trilemma is you can have two out of three things. I think I've already talked about it a little bit. You can have ethnic continuity, low immigration, uh, a little change in the ethnicity of the country. You can have a buoyant economy with a reasonable support ratio, plenty of workers to uh, retirees to support the state, uh, keep the taxes flowing in and uh, look after our elderly and retain dynamism in the economy and you so you can have those and you can have small families pursue your personal interests uh have your kids late um and and uh, avoid and i mean to put it very simply I, I talk about the three e's which are economic growth ethnic continuity and egotism if that's the best you can have two but not all three of those so if you're britain you try to keep the economy moving um, you don't want to have large families, say so you have mass immigration and ethnic change, which gives rise to all sorts of issues like the riots we saw recently and like the Brexit vote, which friends of mine like Eric Calvin and Matt Goodwin have shown have been very much about immigration more than anything. Even if misguided, um, that's what the Brexit vote was and what the Trump vote is. If you get that's the British choice, the Japanese choice is no immigrants. Thank you. We want to stay ethnically homogeneously Japanese. Hmm. Um and um, they won't have kids either, that even less child, that even lower fertility than Britain. And the result then is the kind of waning economy, a falling workforce, um, a government debt at 250% of GDP. Or you can go the Israeli route, which is to have larger families. And that's what I say, you know, don't moan about the immigrants if you're not having your own kids. Now, it could well be that our immigration policies could be more aligned to meeting our economic needs. And if you actually look at the immigration into the UK, huge amount of it is of dependence. You know, it's not actually fixing that problem. Mm -hmm. But the fact remains that uh, if we don't have our own children, um, we're either going to have an ec the economy furring up and, and chronic lack of, of, of workers, um, or we're going to have very rapid ethnic change that comes with immigration. If you're in a country that can attract immigration, not every country can. And of course, as the world gets lower fertility generally, 
fewer and fewer people will be available to immigrate. The remaining countries with high fertility rate are lower and lower productivity countries. So, I mean, in Britain, we have the luxury of Irish and Polish immigration for, well, Irish for centuries and Polish for a long time. Ireland and Poland have got plunging fertility rates. Their, their GDP per capita is not that much lower than Britain's in Poland and significantly higher, somewhat distorted because of the difference of GDP and GMP, which we don't need to go into. But nevertheless, basically, you don't need to come from Ireland or Poland anymore if you want to Britain, if you want to raise your living standards. So we can't, the, the solution to this problem is not more and more of the world rely on fewer and fewer people who are still having children. So it's at, at best, it's a stopgap. Stop gap. And I have done, I go on podcasts with just about anybody because I'm very interested in talking about this. I've done both left-wing and right-wing ones. I did one with Aaron Bastani of Navarra Media, which is kind of major right uh, left-wing. Uh, he, I mean, he would call himself a communist has done, written a book on it. Um, and I've been on quite right-wing podcasts with like the Lotus Eaters or New Culture Forum. I don't know if you know those, a, a British podcast. And the thing I say to the um, the more right-wing people who, who clearly don't want mass immigration is that, you, and I, actually I've said it to Matt Goodwin, who's a, I don't know if you've come across him, but he's a, a major sub-stacker in the UK. And he's quite, in fact, I've said it to Nigel Farage. I've been on his GB News show a couple of times. If you want a reduction in immigration, but you do not accompany it with a surge in the birth rate, it will be a hollow transition. It won't solve the problem. You can only really reduce immigration successfully and sustain popular support for that if at the same time you are as I said in the Sunday Times, growing your own. I mean, various people didn't like that. Uh, but it's high time we stop relying on other people. We thought we're so important and so wealthy and so otherwise engaged mm. that we will leave it to poorer, less important people somewhere in the world to have the children, to raise them, to educate them, and then we'll skim them off as we require. I don't think that's sustainable. I don't think it's moral. And I think all our communities should be thinking about having the sorts of size of family that will sustain them and their futures and not just selfishly relying on other people to do it for them some from some uh, distant country. Now, tell me, Paul, I mean, final question, looking ahead to the year 2100 with, predict uh, with projections showing only a handful of countries having birth rates above replacement levels, what measures should countries begin to implement? And do they implement those in a top-down driven sort of centrally controlled manner or is it something that we can do from a more organic perspective growing it from the bottom up i mean how do you see this i, I know that you say that there are many ways that we should experiment with trying to get the, uh, the, the the population levels up but from a policy perspective is it better to do it in a centrally controlled manner or more of a desegregated sort of bottom-up approach my book uh which i've just published in july uh, no one left why the world needs more children. The, the penultimate chapter is what government can do for us. Right. And the last chapter is what we can do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what I can do for myself or for ourselves, in other words, a one bottom up uh, solution is to write a book like the book I wrote to have conversations like I'm having with you. Yep. Single handedly, it won't make much difference. Plenty of people doing it will shift the culture. That is going to be much more powerful than any government policy doesn't mean governments can't adopt useful policies, and it doesn't mean governments can't encourage the bottom up. I always used to say that cultures down the street, the politics downstream from culture, and I was quite re rightly um, hauled up on that by my friend and co-author Philip Pilkington. He said, why? The government changes the culture on all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. You know, if you'd said uh, things like the death penalty, things like um, gay rights or gay marriage, very often the political class is ahead of where the culture is and it does influence it. So there's space for that. But ultimately, people have got to want to have children. They've got to prioritise it. They've got to understand the problem for themselves personally and for society if they don't. And if that is not the case, if that doesn't happen, no amount of government effort is going to fix this problem. We've got to fix it. You, I mean, I presume like me, you're of an age when you're not expecting to have kids. But I've um, got you know, two young I've, ones. I've got two young ones. So that's OK. okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in the clear. You've done <laughs> your bit. Well done. So I'm, you know, I'm doing the things 
as a grandparent that will encourage my children to have more. And that's not just haranguing them. It's like turning up on a Sunday morning to do some childcare so they can have a lion after a, a busy week. There are all sorts of things we can do as aunts and uncles, as parents, as grandparents. Mm. Uh, if we if we all understood the problem and we all took personal responsibility for the problem, mm. then uh, we will solve the problem. And endlessly and always looking to government to solve everything for us is a bit of a hiding to nothing. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Paul Morland, thanks for joining us and for sharing your insights on The Focus. Thank you. That was British demographer and author, Dr. Paul Morland. Thank you for joining me, John Bruni, for today's episode with Paul Morland. Check out the links in our show notes to learn more about Paul and connect with him on social media. How do you think a declining global population could impact your community? Have you noticed any signs of demographic changes in your area? What policies do you think your government should implement to address the challenges of an aging population and a shrinking workforce? With countries potentially competing for migrants to boost their workforce, how do you think this will affect international relations and immigration policies? Let us know in the comments section below. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a free way to support us. You can also subscribe to the podcast on the Ozcast Network, iTunes and Spotify, where we would appreciate your five-star reviews. Do you have any comments or questions about the podcast? Post them in the comments section on YouTube and I'll do my best to respond to as many as I can. My thanks as ever to producers of The Focus, Malcolm Hughes and Neil Smart. Please stay connected with us on social media. Follow me on X at Bruni Doctor and follow The Focus on X at The Focus underscore Sage. From Adelaide, South Australia, you've been listening to The Focus.